Well, I have to stop and do something because I got time, you know. And uh, this is going to be very boring. But I got to do it. I've been meaning to do it forever because what I did was mix up some nuts. Uh, what, what are these? Number 10s, number 8s, I forget. But I've got 8s and 10 nuts mixed up. And this one thing which lost its tag so I don't even know so anyway I'm gonna separate them the ones that will thread onto this go into this pile and the ones that won't thread onto this go into this pile and uh, I thought I would tell you a story and uh, we'll just do this as we talk so I have told you this story before but I haven't told you the whole story. Many years ago, Charlie and I bought what we were calling our last truck. It was going to be the truck that we used and drove and earned our living with until it was time to retire. And that was in 2008. And I don't know, some of y'all have been with me that long. You remember that truck. And... I called it the Antichrist. I had always bought Freightliners or Kenworths with uh, Detroits or Caterpillars, and I preferred later on all I would buy was Kenworths with Caterpillar engines. And the last truck I was going for not so much looks, but comfort, fuel economy, and uh, the ability to put big, big miles on it so we could put a bunch of money away for retirement. So we get the truck, and I mean the very first day, uh, week, the very first week. We had such engine, big, major engine problems that they had to put it in the shop and rebuild the top end of the engine. It blew my mind. I lost, you know, you lose a week or more getting paperwork and license plates and financing. And and then on top of that, you're renting motels and eating, staying where you're doing all this. So I lost a week of work getting the truck, getting out of the old truck, getting into the new truck. I'm dry, I drive it a week, and it breaks down, and it's in the shop for like nine days. And those son of a bitches, this was Bruckner's in Amarillo, Texas, by the way. Brand new truck. We don't have, you know, uh, 3,000, 4,000 miles on it, which is just a couple of days' work. And they rebuild the top end of the engine, and then they give us a list of stuff that wasn't covered under the warranty, which, as if that's possible. And uh, we were not going to pay it. So that took a few more days of them having to go and get approval for them to pay for a brand new truck that needed engine work right out of the gate. So that was just the beginning of what the rest of our two years with that truck was going to be like. So that was 2008. By 2010, we had spent out of our own pocket, beyond warranty, the first year about 45000 the second year about 60000 Now, let me tell you what else they did. They, when we first got the truck, we were getting eight, 0.3 miles per gallon. Now, that may not seem like a lot, but when you're coming from a truck that's getting 5.5 miles per gallon, 8.3 miles per gallon is a massive increase in your net income, dollar-wise. So we were tickled pink. So suddenly there's a recall on this truck and they don't tell you nothing about it. They wait till you come in for service and they automatically, without asking you nothing, reprogram your truck 
to put far less rail pressure on the fuel pump, which brings your fuel mileage back down to six, six and a half miles per gallon, which may not sound like, like much, but if you add up 200,000 miles a year at six gallons a mile, miles per gallon, or 8.3 miles per gallon, and then you do the math as far as what a gallon of diesel fuel costs, you'll see what a gigantic decrease in our income they just without talking to us wiped out Volvo so our second year <laughs> we had we broke down so often that it put a gigantic dent I want to say dent I can't think of a stronger word it destroyed our income and we were living on our savings because we we were losing see when you break down and you're under a load you lose that load somebody else comes and picks that trailer up and delivers it and they get paid for it so we were coming up with money to pay for these repairs that I mean they won't let you have your truck unless you pay for your repairs and if you have an argument over a warranty claim, you take it up with a court. If they say no, they say no, and it's up to you to uh, beat them in court. Who's got that kind of money or time? So this truck is just, it's just destroying us financially. And uh, by the time we realized that there was no working through this, we had uh, exhausted our savings we had lost our motorcycles, our camper, our boats, and we were just barely able to hang on to our pickup truck and our house. It absolutely ruined us. During that time, at the worst financial time in our life, we had a friend, uh, and I'll say her name, she passed away, and I'll tell you that story. Diane. She had a motorcycle wreck. And she was in bad, bad shape. Well, uh, she was a single mother. And uh, she lived in a mobile home with her teenage boys. And the mobile home was literally collapsing around her. And she made very little money. You know, so we assumed she cried poor to us constantly, even though, you know, we, she knew what our financial situation was. So in the midst of my own financial ruin, I rebuilt her mobile home stick by stick. I had to pull the floor up. I had to rebuild the subframe, the floor joists, the bottom plates, I had to tear walls out. And uh, I did this on my own dime. Took me weeks and weeks and weeks on my time off to rebuild her home. Didn't ask for a penny. And uh, it's a good thing because she wouldn't have given us a penny, turns out. So we did it all on our own dime, including when I got to the painting and decorating part, putting the house back together. Uh, you know, we bought the vinyl and the curtains and the paint. And uh, it was like a brand new house on the inside. Okay. She gets a little better. And a uh, year goes by, and we, at this point, we are just destroyed financially. It's, like I say, it's all we can do to hang on to our house now at this point. And uh, Diane comes down with cancer. And it was very, very fast. It was inoperable. And she tried chemo, and we brought her all over the place for therapy and and uh, so it's obvious that she's going to pass away. <clears throat> so now she wants to prepare. So Diane, you know, now she's in a wheelchair. So my wife and I, she wants to get, you know, her income, her, her money 
where her sons can access it and take care of her while she's dying. So we take her to several banks and she's, you know, giving powers of attorney. And uh, now let me back up just a little bit. The wreck left Diane with some kind of brain damage. And uh, this is the only reason that she was willing to let us help her because I don't think she remembered all the money we spent and all the effort I put into rebuilding her house. And when we got her to all these banks and added up the money she was transferring, we were absolutely floored that she had this amount of money, way more money than we ever had, way more, and was transferring it from one bank to another and signing powers of attorney for her sons. And we were flabbergasted, flabbergasted, shocked that she let us spend all that money knowing the kind of financial problems we were having and didn't say, look, I'll pay you back or I'll pay for this. She had so much money and the money we spent on her house, who knows, may have pulled us out of the financial ruin that we were crashing into. And that was the turning point in my life. I, up till then, I helped people. I built handicap ramps. I would pay bills for people that were out of, you know, that had water fixing to be shut off. Uh, I mean, anonymously, most of the time. And that there was such a kick in my face that I stopped being a charitable, generous person. And uh, I turned into a greedy, selfish person. And I did not help anybody anymore after that until I had a friend and I slowly came out of my, I don't know, I don't know what you would call it, my unwillingness to be helpful to people. And, uh, so anyway, I started helping a little and doing things. He was a friend, so I don't want to be too specific, but I did a lot for him. No fees, no charges. Most of the time, the parts were on me, and we were friends for a few years, and that's that was the extent of our friendship was I would fix broken shit for him. And the one and only time I ever asked him for any help, he wouldn't help me. And it was a simple thing. It was a ride. I needed a ride from uh, where I was dropping my truck off back to my house. And he wouldn't help me. And that was it. That was the straw. That was it. I was done being a helpful person and I was just gonna be concerned about me and Charlie. Charlie had had by the, you know, that time she'd had cancer. And that was another thing, you know, you know who your friends are when your wife is in the hospital near death and your busy friends can't come visit. And it sure left me with a bad, bad taste in my mouth. And affected me for a very long time. And uh, until recently, I was that kind of person. Very, very reluctant to be uh, charitable or kind or generous or helpful or sympathetic. It was me and Charlie against every motherfucker out there and that's how I felt. I was done worrying about other people and I was worrying about me and my wife. I just said a bad word, sorry about that. So here I am today. I have a lot of time to 
think about my own, what do you call it? My makeup, what makes me, what, what makes me be the person I want to be. And I wonder if all these weren't, all these betrayals of kindness, these betrayals of charity, the, these betrayals of trust weren't a test for me to see just how convicted I was to my desire to be of help to the world. Or my fellow man, I don't want to sound all artsy and shit, but uh, I think you know what I mean. You know, at the end of the day, you have two people that you have to answer to. And one of them is our creator. And the other one is that person inside you that knows your real person, your real character, your real values. And uh, that's the person that you need to live with every single day. And can you be proud of that person? And uh, I wasn't. And when I joined the PGR, the Patriot Guard, I realized that I could, without spending money, just my time, show some kindness and love, and uh, support my fellow human, and get back into the game of being uh, the person that I like to be, kind and charitable and generous and sympathetic and loving, and try to wipe some of the darkness out of my soul. And sometimes you just have to force yourself through things you don't want to do because you've been this route and it's kicked you in the face so many times. And that's where I'm at now. My wife and I, we went over to the uh, animal shelter to bring some dog food there. And I suspect that we are going to find time to volunteer at the animal shelter soon. I think her and I, you know, we've experienced the same kind of betrayal over the years. And it has affected us the same way. And, uh, I think we're both at the same point where we're testing the waters of trust again and see if we want to get back into the the game, I guess, and, and risk having our hearts broken again. Boy, it's just taking forever, huh? And, you know, some people who have been on the other end of this are probably thinking, well, just get over it. But they have no idea the destruction that they caused to our goodwill. And uh, it wasn't just a, a outward, I don't have time because of X, Y, Z. There's no good excuse for not having time for your friends, none. And you can make excuses, but that doesn't excuse it. And uh, it has an effect on people that they'll never get over. So anyway, here we are. And we're at that point in our life where, you know, we're in the final probably dozen or so years of our life, if we're fortunate. And uh, I don't want to go to my maker with this darkness, this this... black cloud of mistrust that I have in me and I'm going to work hard to purge my soul of it and I guess the decision is do you want to continue letting life and people kick you in the face and hurt your soul hurt your heart or do you want to just open yourself up and say I'm going to keep being the person that I want to be, and you can kick me all you want, and you're not going to stop me. You know, when we moved to this town, it was one punch in the face after another. 
And uh, still, this is one weird town. It's uh, probably the, the, the most unfriendly place I've ever lived, which, you know, I didn't move here to make friends with everybody. And then the taxes. My God, if I had any, any idea how much the taxes were going to be here, probably wouldn't have moved here. Should have done that research before I moved here. That was my fault. And slowly, we have worked our way into finding ways to enjoy it here and uh, finding people to spend our time with. One of them is the PGR, Patriot Guard, which uh, leads me to <laughs> another, another thing I want to talk about. I hope they never find my YouTube channel because I'm going to get talking about well, maybe I won't name them specifically. It's a Patriot Guard group. Not the one that I'm a member of, but the one I'm sharing my time with because, uh, you know, I'm close to that part of their state. Oh, I gotta move a little bit. Oh, my legs are killing me. I went to a soldier's funeral the other day and the man who was in charge of that particular group of uh, Patriot Guard riders was a clown. He was not part of that group. He was not there for the right reasons. It was like a party with him. He was laughing and joking, which may be fine when you're not in a flag line standing in honor of the person that's passed away and his family that's walking through the, the flag line. He would not shut up he would not stop joking. He would not stop laughing at a funeral. Of all the most inappropriate places to yuck it up, I was shocked and I was honestly embarrassed to be a part of it and have them people see this guy uh, laughing and yucking it up. And I'm not sure I'm going to go have anything else to do with him. I really wanted to uh, spread my time out and be of service to a larger area of people. But as long as that bozo's in charge of that group over there, I doubt I'm gonna be uh, doing that anymore. He was definitely there for the wrong reasons. And there was nothing more disrespectful than the way he was behaving in the flag line, and it was shocking and embarrassing, and I doubt I'll, I doubt I'll be doing anything with them in the future. And I'm just going to stick to the East Texas Patriot Guards. This is why I put this off. For I knew this for years and years, several years at least, I've known that these were mixed up. <clears throat> and I've always, when I needed, I just had to dig through and find the amount that I needed that would fit, you know, this number 10s. These are number 8s. So I'm glad I'm doing this. And thank you for being here. And uh, the other day I was sitting on my front porch. I think what I think what I'm doing is coming to terms with the world that I can't change. And I have to decide, do I want to become more like the world or, or do I want to continue being the Brad that I like to be? I was sitting on the front porch the other day. This was after my wife and I, we had come home, I think it was Saturday from a really nice ride. It was a short ride, but it was a beautiful day. The temperature was perfect, and we'd found some really nice roads. No traffic, just a beautiful day. And I was really feeling thankful for being alive and having a motorcycle and being able to enjoy a little bit more of life. And uh, we came home, and I sat on the front porch, and the sun was out, and I got to thinking about, you know, being on the verge of potentially another war, perhaps a world war. I mean, I'm not being overly dramatic, but this thing in Ukraine, depending on how involved our country wants to get, could potentially turn into a world war. 
And, uh, you know, all the horrible things that are going on right now. Even the army right now is so watered down with non-binary. I don't want to go into it, but you know what I'm getting at because YouTube won't like me talking about it. Uh, you know, what, what have we got to go to war with, you know? And then I was thinking all these bad things, these potential things that could kill us and destroy our country and and then I started hearing the laughter of children. Uh, one of our neighbors has kids and they have a trampoline and they have friends over. And I was listening to them kids laugh and, you know, playing on the trampoline. And then some other neighbors were having a barbecue and they had people over and they had some music going. And normally the old man and, we, and me would be mad that I could hear their music, but for some reason, I was thinking to myself, everybody in their own way is still, either they're, what did it say? Ignorance is bliss. Either, either that or they are ignorantly, blissfully ignorant to what's going on around the world and in our politics, or, you know, they're just not going to let it stop them from leading happy lives. I'm not talking about the kids. I'm talking about the adults at the barbecue. And uh, it dawned on me that, you know, it's, it is just a matter of happiness is a matter of, uh, it, for the most part, is a matter of choice. Now, sometimes when your body is in pain, it is really hard to find your way to happiness through pain. But uh, I am experiencing that, too. So I'm choosing to do things that don't hurt like this, even this is, is killing me sitting here. My legs are killing me, but I'm happy. I'm in my shop, I'm doing things I like to do. When I get these lights up, it'll make a difference. So I guess that's what it boils down to, with this world falling apart. When I look back over my 62 years of life, how long has the world been falling apart? And how long have old people been complaining about the state of the world? As long as I've been alive. So, my decision is to try my hardest not to dwell on the bad and to look for the good. And you know, here was a pivotal point just recently in my life. When Charlie and I went to the funeral for those 13 unclaimed veterans, the, the veterans who had passed away and their remains lay in the funeral homes for years, some of them, unclaimed. And I went there, and I really expected to see, because it was pouring rain, pouring rain. Uh, my friend Rob is there. He was there. Rob, uh, just playing Common Sense over in Bozier. My friend, my motorcycle riding friend. When, we've been friends for a lot longer than that, but longer than motorcyclists. But uh, anyway, he was there. Uh, some other members of the East Texas Patriot Guard were there. And I was shocked, pleasantly shocked, and, and very much encouraged by the amount of people that showed up in the pouring rain and the gusting wind with umbrellas collapsing. Women in dresses and, you know, makeup and high heels stood out there in the pouring rain. There's and I'm not exaggerating, there was hundreds and hundreds of people that showed up for those unclaimed veterans' funeral. And it made my heart feel so good, I could almost not talk about it. It, it was such a pivotal moment in my life that it sort of recharged the batteries that had been drained all these years from my extreme disappointment in, in people. So that was, yeah, batteries being charged. That's the way I'm going to describe it. And when my wife and I left, there was more people than I even realized. There were so many people there that they couldn't get in the cemetery. And it's a huge, gigantic veteran cemetery. People were parked a quarter mile down the road and walked that far in the rain to get to the cemetery to stand in the rain and pay their respects and be those homeless veterans' family for 
couple hours. <clears throat> and uh, it surely was a, an eye opener for me that there are good people still on this planet that love and are kind and are sympathetic and are generous and are caring for their fellow man. And the thing is, I just have to look harder for them. Uh, I think part of the reason that they are so hard to find or hear or see is because the news does not go and look for them. They go and look for the shootings and the carjackings and the murders and the drugs and the bad politicians. Good news does not sell. And part of my problem is I like to be informed but at the same time, I've allowed my soul to be polluted with the, the badness that comes with information. Hello, baby. Oh, you got a haircut. You got your hair did. You're going to have a shower before you go in. Breezy had his hair cut off. He was getting long and shaggy. He looked like a hippie. A poodle hippie. I'll pick you up in a minute. Just a minute. I got like 30 more of these to do, and then I'll pet you. So, that's where I'm at mentally, or, you know, emotionally, I guess, if you want to use that word. No, I'm not starting my period. <laughs> God, I'm glad I did this, because now, I, once and for all, I knew it was going to be a long, boring task, but uh, when you're in the middle of a project, you don't want to spend this kind of time separating stuff and this is probably all I'm going to do today so if I do feel like doing any more I have another uh, dusk to dawn LED light which is about twice this size and uh, I may I'm going to put that up on the back side of my house shining out towards the woods not because I'm worried about people but because we have you know fox coyotes raccoon possum skunks and before we let the dogs out we have to check the yard out pretty good and get all them out of our yard before we let the dogs up because they will want to go and be friends. Uh, a long time ago, Joe, our old dog, he decided he wanted to go chase the, uh, the black kitty with a white stripe down its back. And he learned that those black kitties with the white stripes smell pretty bad. <laughs> and we had to go to work and he was our truck dog. And my God, we smelled, people looked at us weird for months because we smelled like skunk. We washed that dog and washed him and washed him and washed him. And we, we, it took probably a year for him to stop smelling like a skunk. I sure do miss old Joe. He was a good dog. He spent his entire life riding with us in the truck, 14 years. And uh, he did not want to be anywhere else when we were home. Anytime we would go out the door, he would run to the truck. So uh, he was a truck dog, and that's all he wanted to be was a truck dog. And after Joe died, we got a dog. We called her. Her name was Angel, but we, for some reason, we kept calling her Angie, and we just changed her name to Angie. She was a rescue. But she did not like being in the truck. And uh, we gave her about six months, and she did not adapt. She didn't want to be in the truck. You'd have to fight her to get her in the truck. So we found a home for her. You know, we'd only had her six months, and she was like four years old. And we didn't want her. She liked, she liked running and being in the yard. And, and gosh, she escaped so many times. She was a, a wandering dog. So we found somebody with a big yard and kids to keep her occupied. And uh, then we were dogless for a couple of years. And then along came Sunny, who will be 14 very soon. And she's getting so old, it's hard to watch. Okay. That was a mess. A mess. Let me see if I can do this without spilling them everywhere. And then we got Breezy who is right below me. I 
And then we come across Lucy Bell. Lucy was uh, somebody was giving away puppies. They were way too young to be leaving their mama. They were only four weeks old, but he was tired of messing with them. And he told us that if whatever dogs he didn't get rid of, he was going to the pound with them. And you know what they do with puppies at the pound. Plus, she was a mix, which wasn't even a, a desired breed, uh, bulldog and mountain cur. And he had one puppy left. It was the runt. She had been chewed up. She was in bad shape. And before we left the yard sale, the we got that dog and brought her home. And we've had her since she was four, four weeks old. That was Lucy Bell. And she's almost 10 now. Nine or 10. Yeah, almost 10. Which is pretty old for a dog her size. Okay, let me get back to work. You probably quit watching a long time ago. I forgot a very important part of the Diane story. After I rebuilt Diane's house, that is when she had her motorcycle wreck and was in a wheelchair, and her sons, she all she had was steps up into her house, and her sons had to pick her up in her wheelchair and get her in and out of her house that way, so... I built a small 8x8 deck and then a very long uh, handicap ramp so she could wheel out of her house and down her handicap ramp. And uh, that was also on my dime. And after that is when she got cancer and we were taking her all over to several different banks that she had money in and putting it all in one bank account for her and giving her sons access to it that we realized that she was very, very wealthy by any standard, and she chose to live poor. I mean, her whole, you know, her kids suffered, everybody suffered because of her choice to uh, play poor, I guess. And uh, she had, I'm not even gonna name the figure, she knew that we were on the verge of bankruptcy. We were on the verge of losing our business. We were on the verge of losing things that we had worked for. And yet, she still let us pay for all that that we did for her in her house and rebuilding her house and getting her life put back together. Let us pay for it knowing the financial straits we were in. And she had many, many, many thousands of dollars in the bank and we're talking about uh, money that would have made a gigantic difference in her life and uh, you know if we hadn't spent the money that we spent on her house it would have made a difference in our life but you live and learn so there was more to that story and then here was a little window into her soul her sister had a diesel pickup truck and she had come across a fuel stop that would let you get diesel fuel for free and wouldn't register it on the pump. So Diane calls us and says, get your truck and come over here to this fuel stop because you can fill your tanks up and it doesn't register as if we would do that. And there is there is a definite separation between somebody that would willingly steal fuel, and it's stealing, you know, there's no gray area. When you take diesel fuel and you're not paying for it, that's theft. And there's a definite separation between people that would do that and think nothing of it, and people that were, would be shocked that you would be willing to do that. It would be no different than going to a gas pump and filling up your tank and not getting charged for it, and then going back over and over and doing it, uh, you know, it's theft. And, you know, if that's the kind of person you are, that's the kind of person you are. But that, that is a real window into your soul. Anyway, that's it. On to the next project. My dogs all got their hair cuts. Except her. She's a short-haired dog, so she doesn't need it. And I think I'm done for the day. We'll see you. I got a little project I'm going to do. And this is inspired by a video that 65 Ford did because he was having the same problem I'm having 
you know, the shop is fairly bright. The garage here is fairly bright, except for on this end where it doesn't make any sense to put lights because when I roll the garage door up, you wouldn't be able to see them. So what Mo did was install lights on his garage door. So when the garage door came up, they would illuminate the area that's usually dark. And uh, I had some lights. These lights were on the back side of my shop trailer where the carport came down. And I'm not sure yet that they even uh, work because they've been exposed to weather for, well, since last winter when the, when the winter storm took down the carports. So I'm gonna check these and see if they're even working. Oh my God, yeah, that works. These are bright. Okay, they both work. So I'm gonna roll the garage door up and see exactly where they would uh, benefit me the most. And I'm saying the second panel down. Uh, one probably right in the middle here and one closer to the, maybe uh, in this one here. So, cause that would be right above the motorcycles. I think I'll do that. And you know, on sunny, sunny days when the sun is shining in here, it's not so bad. But on days like today when it's gray and gloomy and probably gonna rain, I gotta get a bunch of screws and stuff out of my pocket because they're poking me in the leg. Okay, so now I gotta figure out how I'm gonna mount these. And uh, I'll figure something out. Let me uh, get a look at these and see if I can screw through the uh, outer edges here. And I'll use some uh, corner brackets to hold them on. I'll be able to take all this crap off. All right, I got them mostly apart. And uh, I'm gonna take uh, my angle grinder with a cutting disc and I'm just gonna lop these things off. I'm probably going to, <clears throat> there's uh, screw holes all the way around this. I'm probably just, just going to take this screw and this screw out, drill straight through it, and then come through this away with uh, some long bolts with washers that I can put a little sil silicone around so that it doesn't leak on the inside, although that garage door doesn't see much rain. Let me uh, work a little bit more on this. We'll be right back. Yeah, I kind of came up with a, a different place I wanted to mount them. So, uh, let me show you what I'm doing. I already got one up. Thank you. 
this place that I'm going to mount them actually shines in a direction that would benefit me when I'm waxing the bikes. And uh, it looks like that's going to be one of my occupations. Give me just a second. If I don't put tools away, I never will. You are not gonna believe what I did. I mounted these things back backwards. I'll be right back. I gotta switch these uh, brackets around the other direction. did this really this is where I need the light on both sides and uh, you coming in because I'm gonna close the door come on come on breezy without daylight coming in from outside this is where I need the light And uh, this hits right up here where I need it. So that way I don't gotta put holes in my door and make sure they don't leak. And then I don't have to figure out how to run the wire where I can open and close the door with a, a wire not being in the way. So uh, this will work. And some of that light is cast over here and some of this light is cast on that side of the bike. So even when I'm in here, you know, working out other stuff, I'll have light on both sides. So there we go. There's that little project. Now I'm going to go home and drink a bottle of water. And I may get that light out. And depending on, we're supposed to have some rain. So depending on where that rain is, uh, will determine on what I do next. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I was going to give you something pretty to look at. I was going to turn the camera around to face me, but how about the motorcycle? So, if you uh, watch this whole thing, God bless you. <laughs>